Welcome to the Content Strategy Interviews Podcast. Each week, we talk with accomplished content strategy experts to share their wisdom with our friends in the content community. And now, here's your host, Larry Swanson. Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode number 22 of the Content Strategy Interviews Podcast. I'm really delighted today to have on the show with us Sarah Richards. Sarah is a legend in the field of content strategy, uh, justifiably, and um, she began like so many of us in journalism and then went into some advertising. But for most of the last 15 years, she's been working on the uh, the UK.gov website and various uh, predecessors and iterations thereof. Um, About 15 years ago, she started with DirectGov, which was uh, the government's, uh, the UK government's first attempt to kind of tidy up their their web presence. And then the real fun started happening in, um, I think it was 2011, when she became the content design lead at... um, the government digital service. So uh, that's the quick overview of Sarah, but I'd like to give her a chance to talk about, uh, to kind of contextualize her experience and career. Uh, but first, welcome, Sarah, and uh, yeah, tell the folks more about yourself. Hello. Um, you just did that amazingly. Maybe we should just go with that. I, uh, I actually started in design. I studied design um, and art. I had, you know, batik printed dungarees and a half a shaved head and I was terribly arty farty Uh, and I went into design and then I went into advertising and while I was there somebody told me that copywriters earn more money (laughs) so I switched discipline (laughs) because at 19 years old I was massively mercenary just wanted the money um I'm not like that now I'm much better now um so yeah and then and then it was just a career path of editorial and uh checking people's uh, grammar and then moving on to what is content, should we have it, where should it go, then user-centered in GDS, and uh, then I'm here. Right, so I'm really curious. So the first thing I wanna ask is, uh, I wanna talk a little bit about some of the details of that story of your your work at the Government Digital Service, because it's just, it's an amazing, great story. Uh, um, But the first thing I wanna find out is, when was the term, when did you articulate the, the field of content design? It actually stemmed from the term itself. So in, uh, I'm trying to think, late 2010, early 2011, um, I was standing outside the office in the freezing cold with the director, Tom Loosemore there. He um, wrote the original report with Martha Lane Fox that sparked the whole of the government digital service. And he kind of said, okay, tell me about editorial and government. What do you want? If you had anything, what would it be? Blank sheet, go. And I just went right off into one because I'd had years of frustration, years of it, in government. We did a, we did a project for the DirectGov website, the one you were talking about. Um, and we were taking 185 sites down into one. We had five templates in our content management system, three of which you know, we couldn't use. One was useless and we were kind of stuck to one. Um, and... It was, a very, it was a very difficult project and we had no backup, no mandate. We didn't have strong leadership. It was, it was quite difficult. So then when he said, well, what do you want? How are we gonna do this? I just, I just went right off into one. And um, <clears throat> I said, you know, content people should not be stuck with just words because we have developers on this project. We have designers sitting right next to us. You know, if, if the audience needs a calculator or a tool or a calendar or a video or, a, you know, whatever it is, that's what we should give them, not just words. So we need to change the way that government thinks about us. Because we, we spend a lot of time thinking about how we speak to our audience, but not actually about how we speak to each other. So we were having a chat about that and content design was born because we were designing the content we were designing it with the designers and with the developers and with the user researchers. Um, and it was a whole effort of, of kind of everybody. So that's kind of when the term was born. And, and across government, you know, everybody was laughing. They're like, you're calling yourselves what now? What is this? And, um, <clears throat> and that's what it was for. It was to spark a conversation because we'd been trying to do all this stuff. You know, loads of people, whatever they call themselves, editors, copywriters, journalists, whatever, um, they all try their hardest, right? Nobody wakes up in the morning and thinks, I'm going to be a git today. Nobody thinks these things. Um, So we were trying to all do it, but couldn't pull it together as one. 
So what I could say then was like, we, we are the content design team. This is our remit. This is our scope. These are all the things that we're doing now. Yeah. And this whole thing where you expect us to just proofread and check your grammar and that sort of thing, that, that stops now. Right. It's all on the user need and it's producing content based on that need. So it was, it, the term actually was to open up the conversation in the British government in 2011. Gotcha. Did that come out of that, that, that rant in the freezing cold on the sidewalk with your boss? That's where, <laughs> yeah. okay. I love that. That's a great origin story. Uh, <laughs> that's a, that's a, a great, um, and what are the, it sounds like, you know, the, the, the reading, uh, like your blog post about that experience and then inferring from uh, many of the examples you use in your book about, uh, oh, I should, I'll hold up your book and I'll also link to it, but this is, uh, <laughs> this is Sarah's book, everyone, content design. Um, and, um, it's what percentage of your work is people stuff versus word stuff? Oh, 80% people. 80%. <laughs> you know, digital transformation is very little about the tech. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, it, it's mostly about the people because the tech you can just go and you can analyze and you can just buy the thing. That's the right thing. Or you get the developers. That's the right developer or whatever. But in content, it's, it's, who's signing off what, who's creating it, who's setting the content strategy for this, what should we be saying, what are we not going to say, um, you know, what a consistency we're going to have across all the channels, it's all people-based. Mm -hmm. So we're, you were in the government, from, uh, but you had done some consulting with the government before that, right? But anyhow, you were around the government for a while. Um, did you, I've been doing this a while too, and I remember many places having that transition from the web stuff going from IT or the computer guys or whoever to the, how did you wrest control of the content from the, from the, other, um, uh, the other parties? Or, or did you, or how, how did that come about? How did you end up being able to, to take, take control of that? At GovUK, you mean? At uh, Gov yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so we created a content management system, um, and we didn't give anybody access. <laughs> it, was <my> <laughs> <thing>. <laughs> it was. Do you know what? It was really difficult. It's one of the kind of. It's one of the defining moments. We sat. Uh, there was Tom Lewis Moore again and me. We sat with. The, it used to be called the franchise directors meeting, because all the government departments were seen as franchises don't know why, could have just called them departments, but never mind. And they had these heads of there. And um, <laughs> Tom said, okay, so Sarah's got a new workflow for you and a new process, and this is what we're gonna do. And I said, okay, so we're gonna take in all the data, we're gonna do the user needs based on what we've got at the moment, because we were just dealing with the kind of top 100 needs for government for the beta, for the WK beta. I said, so we get, you know, we're gonna write all those and then we're gonna to come to you for fact checking. And they all went, mm -hmm, sign off. And I went, no, fact checking. You don't need to sign things off. I'm not asking for your approval. I'm asking you to check the facts. And then we're going to publish it. And there was like silence in the room. Do you know what I mean? There was just, a, the only sound were jaws dropping. And it was like, you can't do this. And it's like, mm, yes, we can. Um, and it was, it was horrible. <laughs> it, was, it was one of the most uncomfortable meetings of my life, but a very happy one as well. Cause I'd worked at direct gov for five years. I'd had to deal with these people. Um, if we told them that we didn't want to publish five and a half thousand words on how to put on a jumper cause it's cold. Um, they would threaten to take our funding away. And stuff like that. So, so, so we were really on the back foot when we started this. So going in and saying, you know, we're content experts. We're experts at content and we want to work for the user. We need the facts. We need it to be right. We need the accuracy. Um, we need to know what the edges are so that we don't give people a, a bad steer. We need to know all that. But we're going to take care of the user-centered side of it. Right. Um, and to kind of and, and to say that and everybody was kind of freaking out and they told me that they couldn't do it, that we couldn't do it. And uh, yeah, because we designed the content management system, I just didn't, we didn't give anybody access.
You can't control something if you have no access. That's, to. I just got to say that's a brilliant kind of backdoor, side door strategy. <laughs> to you're the clearly the content person, but you're like, oh, I'll take this tech angle and and seize control of the content. But but it's not like you were you were uh, the thing that comes out of that that I'm most curious about is your relentless focus on the user and the end user, and that's uncommon in. I think probably even less common in government than it is in business. How did you cultivate that um, uh, that love for and and stewardship of and and advocacy for the, your your users? Well, that actually started in the alpha before I was even on Gov UK. So there was a little alpha team, and there were twelve of them, I think, again led by Tom, um, and uh, they created the whole um, idea of what it could be, and then they sold it to ministers and people very high up in the government and got buy-in on that way. So by the time we got to the beta, at least the idea was in government. And, you know, there, there were some people across government already doing it, like um, Companies House, which is another government department over here. Um, they, had a, they had a user research team and everything. And, and we had, in Convergence, we had done some user research, but it was seen as, as a tick box exercise. You know, and some of the, some of the research documents, seriously, one of them um, for a department that I should not mention, actually. Um, they paid this agency to do user research and the agency came back and told them stuff that they didn't like to hear. So the agency, the department told the agency that. And then they kind of browbeat them until the research said, basically what the department wanted to hear except on page 12 which was the last page of the report that actually told the truth oh. so that was the kind of environment we were going from so there were there were people there were absolutely loads of people across government that wanted this really badly it wasn't just the gds there were loads of people but mm -hmm. there were more people who were unhappy with it and were blocking it Right. So I'm curious about the, um, so early on you're selling uh, like the, the rant on the sidewalk, you're selling a vision and sort of like years of frustration building up. Um, but ultimately you get pretty high up buy-in from the government. So what was, what were the stories you were telling? Were, were these um, kind of customer success stories? Did you have research that, at a higher level, not the individual customer research, but did you have research that showed the results you were getting with this um, user-centered focus? Yeah, so the alpha, the alpha project mostly did that, and that all had numbers and, and uh, prices because at that time when we were doing the convergence project at, in direct gov, the 185 sites down into one. At that time, um, there were three and a half thousand government websites. Most of them had a team attached. Seriously, there was one called Beefy and Lammy, and it was all about how to cook beef and lamb. Why does the government need to tell you that? I don't know. Um, but <laughs> and they were kind of funding them either directly or indirectly, or they had some sort of view of it. Um, but three and a half thousand, it, it's not hard, I don't think, to see the savings you can make. It's a lot harder to convince people that quality is important and that doing it in a user-centered way is important. Um, but I didn't do that. Uh, other people did that. I've got it. Yeah. Hey, what you just said about the, uh, the, the beef and lamb site. Um, did you hear Christina Halverson's, uh, um, uh, South by Southwest talk? She just did like a week or so ago, uh, her kind of take on content marketing. And it reminds me of that, that, um, like really does every plumber need to do a, how to unclog your drain content marketing scheme? Uh, that it's sort of, it seems like it's in that same family. Yeah, very much. I mean, they, they were just stupid. I've, I've got examples of like, at the time when um, the Afghanistan conflict kicked off, there were nine different government websites giving you nine different views and nine different ways of talking about the same thing. And the thing is, is that you never know whether you get to the end of it. So people weren't trusting government, they were trusting the BBC because they have one view, whereas government was spouting nine different views. And that whole content marketing of just, we're gonna get the traffic and we're just gonna push it out there. I, I think it has the opposite effect. People go, oh, well, you've got it and you've got it and you've got it and you've got it. I'm just gonna, oh, I don't know when I got to the end of it, which one am I gonna go for? So I think it has a kind of, yeah. An yeah, well, like with your approach, if, if the BBC has nailed it, you would just link to them or send people there, use that content, right? Yeah, I mean, with government, they should, 
and do have a position on the war that we are waging, you know, they should definitely do that. But we should have been doing it better than anybody else. Mm -hmm. And we weren't because it wasn't user focused. It was department focused. What does the department want to say about this? It was push publishing. I'm going to push this out and see what happens. Digital is by its very nature, pull publishing. You pull it towards you. And exactly. they weren't doing any of that. They were just blasting it. So blasting it. Yeah, well, that's, I mean, that when I think about the big concepts involved here, that's the huge, that's the top level one, the push versus pull. But there's a couple other things that I, that I was just, um, you know, writing and publishing and editing and all that stuff used to be thought of as very linear, very solitary work too. Like they have the writer tucked away their, their keyboard and, and you've, and we've all seen the transformation from that to this iterative collaborative kind of writing. And that's what content design is all about, right? Is, is managing that uh, and, and planning for that um, iterative and and collaborative uh, process of getting the right content out there is that a good summary or yeah it is, it is very much it's based on the user need and the user need may not always be words and it may not be words on a website it could be any part of the journey that people are having it could be on any of those channels so content design takes a look at everything and understands where information should be, at what point, using what language, in what format that it's supposed to be in to get the audience to do what they need to do. May not be what they want to do. Right. Maybe that's different things. Yeah, that's, I think, every writer, every content creator struggles with that. The um, getting, well, first of all, coming, we all figured that out, I don't know, a couple of years into your career, like, oh, they said they wanted, but they never read that, but when I do this, they read that. Um, how do you, how, how, how much have you streamlined that process of separating uh, needs from uh, ostensible wants? Do it on two different levels, actually. If I'm doing content strategy sessions with organizations, I ask them to put out, what is it that you want? What do your users want? Because businesses have needs. They have, need, they, they have to sell stuff or do stuff, otherwise they wouldn't exist. So it's kind of, what do you want? What do they want? How are we going to make that work? Because if there is no user need, that is all push publishing. It can work. You know, there's a massive ad industry. But Dave Trott, um, who's a, a creative director, he estimated, I think he said $89 billion per year uh, of global advertising is ignored because it's push. Wow. So, yeah. I'm not, I'm not surprised by that, but it's good to have a number attached to it. I would definitely check that number, but I'm fairly <laughs> okay. certain that's what he said. I'll he go yeah. um, so I would take the business needs and the user needs and kind of see how they work. But then the user needs, so like to take a case in point, I work for Citizens Advice. It's the largest advice giving charity in the UK. I built them a team. Um, and we have people coming in with debt problems. And what they want is for you to take the debt problem away. What they need is a set of steps that they can go through so that they can get rid of their own debt problems. You know, the advisors help them. Certainly they do letters and they do phone calls and they really help them. Absolutely. But they need to understand what they're going through so that they don't get into that situation again um, and to take control. Of these things so again it's that want versus need and so that is also very much set up in the content design process of where do we give what information because if we load everything at them on an application form they're not gonna get that but if we give it to them two steps ahead they're not gonna get that either because who remembers stuff that they did last week I'm really sorry about the cat business oh, no worries. Um, it wouldn't be an internet thing without a cat. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't have a cat or two. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so that's the kind of you need to manage their expectations all the way through. You need to understand what it is that they're thinking all the way through and then either reflect it, rebut it. You need to educate. You need to do something with it. That's the content design process. It's not push it and hope. Gotcha. And how um, – you've so it's this – the um, – the, the UK.gov revamp was kind of wrapped up about five years ago now. I'm curious about the, um, the ongoing, like the governance and the, and the, the sort of the maintenance of, the, uh, of this and, and the, um, uh, the lessons learned from uh, some ongoing uh, uh, activity. You know, like uh, how much 
you know, how much has the content changed? How much, you know, like, are there further lessons learned from the, um, from the, the, the great story that got to the point of the, the, the original launch? Um, so it's still going on in a massive, massive way. Um, you know, when I started, there were, I can't think, 14 people maybe. When we launched the beta, I had 46 in my team. And there are a couple hundred in GDS. Now I think you'd have to check, but I think there's 600 people in GDS now. Wow. And wow. yeah, people across government, they have their own academy um, where they train people in user center design um, and user research in design and service design. Um, so yeah, it's still going on in a massive, massive way. I think for somebody sitting outside, it can be a little bit, disheartening to be brutally honest because mm. there is a slide in my opinion because when we did the original top 100 needs we controlled everything and then what we said to the departments was we're going to take this 100 and you can fact check that but we have that um but you can publish all your information to this other side of it so if you do wk forward slash and then it's like I don't know, child tax benefit, that'll be mainstream. That'll be the GDS core team. If you do um, WK forward slash, uh, you know, department for work and pensions and then child tax benefit, that's the departments. Now the departments can d publish straight. Um, they don't need to go through the central team for that. Um, and there are thousands and thousands and thousands of pages now. Uh, okay. You're going to search, it's just, it's dying. And no, no search engine will ever be able to cope with that. It's not a technical thing. It's not a search problem. It's a publishing too much information it's, problem. Right. So, um, well, that's, I, and that's, I, well, the scale of something like the, the UK government, that's got to be about as bad a problem, you know, as, 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 <laughs> as, 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 as big a proving ground as you could have for that issue. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I guess, uh, but you're you've you've kind of you left that in your on other things now. But um, um, hey, I want to go back a little bit. I I, I was the, some of the as you know you said earlier that like eighty percent of this is people stuff, and um, I, talking about like well one of the other, and one of the things that comes out of that and one of the um, interesting innovations in how people work with one another is that, that idea of. Um, uh, paired writing and and crits the critiques of, of each other's writing Can you tell me about I'm really curious about how that where and when that came along and and how that developed and, and how you're using it today? So crits came from my design background so um, when when I was at art school um, you sat around and you had a design crit and Everybody just used to hammer into your work. Basically. <laughs> they used to just tear it to shreds um, and at GDS, they were having design crits, and I thought, I'm having that. I'm just going to swip it to content. And I ripped off one of the rules from Agile, um, and it says, um, it's an understanding that everybody did the best job possible with the information they had at the time. And I just thought, that is one of my core cool rules, and it will always be my core cool rule. Um, and I came up with kind of three others that, that are my standards. Um, and they work really well. If they're done well, they can work really well. So we do them really early. So once you've done a discovery and you've got the basic mental models and you've got language and you've got headings, we'll do a crit and just make the user needed this. This is what I'm thinking, what's going on. And everybody will say, yep, that's great. It fits with this. It doesn't fit with that, whatever. Um, and then people come back with a skeleton and a draft. Um, and then we crit that and we do that with designers and with developers because they have that different view of things. So we can say things like, well, that telephone number, for example, is going to be pulled out across the site. And so the designer can say, great, it's going to be a design element. So that, again, that multidisciplinary thing at crit level is amazing. Um, also use them to teach the rest of the organization. So particularly if you've got people who are blocking and they kind of, they don't, understand why you do the things that you do then if you all sit down together and you look at a piece of work you're not talking about each other that's one of my rules you're not allowed to talk about each other you can only talk about the product so again you can kind of get past those things because you're creating a common goal that you're all working towards it's not this us and them 
you know, I'm in the digital team and I'm in the legal team and uh, get rid of it all. <laughs> the only thing we're doing <laughs> is this one sheet of paper. So crits can be great. So yeah. Um, so we stole that from the designers. Pair writing again, that came from the developers ah. for us. I mean, all of these things have been around in various guises for, you know, eons. So, you know, but we, um, we actually saw the developers pair writing and it was just like, oh yeah, that's, it's just, for some of it, it's just getting a title that everybody can get hold of. Because of course we would work together. Of course we would collaborate. We called it peer review before pair oh, writing. So, yeah. you know, it's, and some people have pair writing and then peer review. So, you, you know, it's all these, it, it's quite amazing to me that we as word people can't decide on a common set of terms for what we do. Like we should, we, we of all people should be able to do this, right? right. We, well, in, a, in our defense, we're only about 20 years into this, so. We've got, we've got at least a hundred years before we get out. Yeah. Still be a lot of horse and buggy thinking and uh, yeah, for a while here. Yeah. Hey, I just noticed that I can't believe we're already coming up close to time. Um, but um, one thing I, I, I <clears throat> want to put out there just before we wrap up, um, is there anything last, is there anything we haven't talked about that's been on your mind about content design or, or anything, you know, about uh, this, this, uh, this realm that, um, that you'd like to talk about? I think, do you know, the, the one thing that really bugs me is that it's not valued as a skill. Mm. And I think, I hope I'm starting to see that changing. So just since the beginning of the year, um, we've had a lot of people get in touch for recruiting content designers and uh, setting up teams and doing training and, and all the things that we do. But um, it, it has started to ramp up. So previously, you know, everybody with... GCSE English or high school English over there um, thinks they can write for the internet and it, you know that there's no real skill involved and and I disagree I mean I disagree we go to conferences and read books listen to podcasts we do all of these things to really learn our craft and people don't value that they just kind of think anybody with a good turn of phrase can manage um, but I think I'm starting to see a change if your listeners have any views on that, I would love to hear more. I would love to hear. What is, you know, apart from, I think your book is an excellent starting point for that. Um, but are there other resources or conferences, websites, blog, or the things that you'd recommend to, um, for aspiring content designers? So Confab in Minneapolis, that's the kind of biggest um, content conference, I think, in the world probably. And that's amazing. You will literally walk away with your head exploding with new ideas um in terms of twitter there's the kind of brain traffic and gather content they do amazing things um i can't think off the top of my head there's okay. too many <laughs> no, exactly. well and i think and and i think it's probably because you're coming right out of the middle of it if i would if i want to learn about content design i'm going to come to you so yeah, thank <laughs> you very much. yeah. no which is why which is why i called you today um <laughs> Well, um, well, and, and I'll see you at Confab. I, this will be my first time there. I'm um, uh, looking forward to it. I've, you know, I've just, yeah, anyhow, just making it happen this year. So, yes. And you're speaking there, right? Yes. Yeah. What are you going to talk about? I'm doing a workshop uh, which goes over the kind of the 101 kind of content design principles. Um, I go through that pretty quickly. And then I'm also doing a, a chat um, about um, key performance indicators, what success is. Oh, great. Nice. Well, good. Well, I'm looking forward to meeting you at Confab. And, yeah. um, and thanks so much for taking the time to talk with me today. Thank you very much. Great. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Tune in next week for another content strategy interview.